All right, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna go over glycolysis steps one, two, and three. So I laid out this video to make it super easy to understand every single step of glycolysis here. Well, one, two, and three. We're gonna do the other ones later. I've laid out the reactants, the enzyme and the product, as well as the delta G values. And in my own words, I explained what is going on, what is the difference between the molecules, and what the purpose of this was. So this should be the easiest glycolysis video you should ever, you've probably ever seen. Now before I begin, I want to say something that could be controversial. First, thank you so much for 315 subscribers. We broke 300. The last video I had 299, so we gained 16 subscribers, which is amazing. Thank you. So back to the controversial kind of thing I want to say, talk about. I believe, well, sometimes, that students can be better teachers than professors. I know that's a big thing to say and could be controversial, but let me explain why I think this. And it's only sometimes. Professors have been teaching this type of material, material for years, 10, 15, 20 years. They forgot how it feels to be a student learning this for the first time. They don't know what it feels like to have that anxiety learning glycolysis and having a midterm on it the next week. They forget how hard it is to memorize glycolysis. There is a reason that exam averages are low when testing for glycolysis because it's just so much to remember. Students have difficulty remembering the processes of glycolysis because there's so much going on. The reactants, the products, the enzymes, what it looks like, how to draw these molecules. Professors have been doing this for years and they probably to them, it's just like second nature. They can go home and probably dream about this where students have nightmares about this. Me, the reason I'm doing this because this, all of this is fresh in my mind. I've taken biochemistry recently. I remember what it is to feel the anxiety, learning my glycolysis, like all 10 steps, all in one day, in a 90 minute lecture. You're bombarded with information. And by the end of the lecture, no one knows anything. Literally, people are like, I forgot what we just learned. I don't even know what glucose looks like. And I think students can see what we're learning about in different points of view. I can view glycolysis in a way that it makes students able to understand. That's all I wanted to say here is that, um, you know, I really thank you guys supporting me and instead of watching some other professor on YouTube and whatnot, you know, going to a professor asking how do you know how glycolysis works. Instead, you're watching my video, and I'm very, very happy. And I hope I can make you happy as well. So let's begin. Glycolysis. The name comes from gluco and lysis, meaning glucose and to break down. Lysis meaning break down. So that's exactly what we're doing. Glycolysis involves 10 steps. And each step generates a different molecule and a different enzyme. We need an enzyme for every step. And unfortunately, yes, you do need to memorize the structure of the molecules and the name of the enzymes. You don't need to know the structure of the enzymes, just the structure of the molecules, the reactants and the products. The whole point of glycolysis is we're starting from glucose which is this red structure here. And we're ending with pyruvate. That's the end goal. And it takes 10 steps to do that. Here is the net equation for glycolysis. We are starting with glucose, two NAD plus molecules, two ADP molecules, two phosphate molecules. And we're ending with two pyruvate molecules two NADH molecules, two protons, 
two ATP molecules, and two water molecules. Notice that we are starting with one molecule of glucose, but we're ending with two molecules of pyruvate. I'll get into this at step six, because it'll make much more sense. But for this video, let's just step, you know, take, take it step by step with steps one, two, and three. And we're going to take it slowly, because this is something you should not rush when learning. Okay, step one. This is called the energy investment phase. So steps one, two, three, four, and five are called the energy investment phase. To actually get pyruvate, it actually requires energy to actually get there. What we're doing is we're modifying the molecules, the structure of glucose. What we're doing is we're modifying the structure of glucose to actually turn it into pyruvate. But to do this, it requires energy. Okay. So we're starting with glucose. This is step one. It is essential you remember what glucose looks like. It'll actually even help you with the later steps in solving if you're you know, really struggling to remember what a structure, uh, what a molecule looks like. You can actually refer back to glucose and you can solve it that way. So please, please, please remember what glucose looks like. It is a six carbon sugar. Carbon one is right here. This is two. This is three. This is four. This is five. And carbon six is not on the ring. It's attached to carbon five. It's essential you remember that. Instead, the oxygen is the one on the ring instead of a carbon being there. So this is glucose. We're going to take glucose and our body is going to add ATP. Then hexokinase, which is an enzyme, is going to come along. And what hexokinase is going to do? It's going to break up ATP. One of, the eight, one of the phosphates from ATP, because remember, ATP has three phosphates attached to it. It's called adenine triphosphate. Tri meaning three. One of those phosphates is going to go and migrate its way to carbon number six. And we're going to add a phosphate group onto carbon number six. ATP, since we removed one phosphate, is now going to become ADP adenine diphosphate. And that's all. The delta G value is negative 16.7 kilojoules per mole. This means it is irreversible. We are only going in one direction because we're releasing so much energy. The reason we're releasing energy is because when we break apart ATP, when we shred off a phosphate and attach it somewhere, it releases massive amounts of energy. It propels this forward. That's what's happening. So what did hexokinase do? What we did is we removed one of the hydrogens. We, we, we took this hydrogen out here and we replaced it with a phosphate group. PO3. The two minuses is the charge. Don't worry about that. Just PO3. That's all we did. Take out the hydrogen, replace it with a phosphate group. What's the purpose? It allows for a more glucose to enter the cell. Remember the properties of diffusion? So, here we have a cell. Say we have glucose here. And we have glucose outside. Well, we're at equilibrium, so glucose does not want to go inside the cell because of diffusion. Because you already have glucose inside. Why, why do we want to do that? Diffusion doesn't, wanna, doesn't allow us to do that. So our body is smart. Our body is like, wait, wait a second. Why don't we just do this? Why don't we just alter the molecule of glucose that's inside the cell? So we're going to alter it into 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate. This is no longer glucose. This is now glucose 6-phosphate. So diffusion can now activate and propel this glucose that's waiting outside inside the cell. Because there's no glucose inside the cell, it's now glucose 6-phosphate, not glucose. If it was not glucose 6-phosphate, well, this wouldn't work, right? It would just be glucose and diffusion would be at equilibrium. But our body's like, why don't we just transform this molecule into something different so we can allow more glucose inside? And that's the reason for step one. Step two. 
This is a little, more, a little bit more complicated, okay? But we're gonna go slowly. So we're gonna take glucose 6-phosphate, the one we just created, and we're gonna use an enzyme called phosphoglucose isomerase. And it's gonna turn into fructose 6-phosphate. Okay, what an isomer is, is that it's the exact same chemical structure. So the amount of carbons is still the same. The amount of oxygens is still the same. The amount of phosphates is still the same. The amount of hydrogens is still the same. We didn't add or subtract anything. All we are doing is just we're changing the structure of the molecule. Think about like a Play-Doh, for example. You take a Play-Doh from the canister and you form into something, whatever you want it to be. Well, when you're done with it, you can make something else. It's still Play-Doh. It's still the same Play-Doh you got out of the can. You just made something else out of it. Whatever you wanted, whatever you wanted to make. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what people use Play-Doh for. I haven't used it in years. But all we're just doing is it's just the exact same thing. But we're just changing what it looks like. That's it. Okay, so what did he change it into? What we did is notice that glucose 6-phosphate is compro compi uh, com composed uh, of six carbons. However, five of those carbons make up the ring. One carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, five carbons, and an oxygen. So five carbons in the ring in one oxygen. Well, fructose is now one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, and an oxygen. So we moved one of those carbons. And we moved those carbons, that one carbon, from the ring onto carbon number two. So now it's attached to carbon number two, which is right here. To make this easier, look at glucose and look at what is on carbon number six, this. This, right, the CH2OH. Copy and paste this here onto carbon number two. Just copy and paste the exact same thing. But leave, the, leave everything else, right? Because we're still, we still went from glucose 6-phosphate. We, we made this phosphate group, so we're going to leave it there. Everything stays the same. We're just adding the CH2OH. It just looks exactly like glucose, just on a different carbon. Now it's on carbon two. In addition, you're going to flip the orientation of everything else on the molecule besides what is on carbon 5. What do I mean by this? I'm not going to refer to it by the number of carbons, but rather the orientation. So let's look at the bottom right-hand side. This bottom right-hand side. We have a hydrogen on the top. It's facing up and a, hyd and a hydroxide pointing down. Right? This hydrogen's pointing up. This hydroxide's pointing down on the bottom right-hand corner. Well, let's look at the bottom right-hand corner here. It's flip-flopped. The, uh, the hydrogen is now pointing down, and the hydroxide is pointing up. We did the same thing for the bottom left-hand side. The hydroxide here is pointing up. Oh, that was a bad arrow. Pointing up. The hydrogen is pointing down. We just reversed it here on fructose. Now the hydrogen is pointing up, and the hydroxide is pointing down. That's all you have to do. Those are the only two things you're switching. And that's it. So delta G equals negative 1.6 kilojoules per mole. The reaction drives forward because there is more glucose 6-phosphate than fructose 6-phosphate. This is due to La Chatelier's principle. You may have learned this in chemistry. This is not important. It is important for the MCAT. If you're gonna take the MCAT, they could ask this. They could ask, why is this reaction moving forward? It's because of La Chatelier's principle. The reason there is more glucose 6-phosphate is because of step one. It is irreversible. Glucose is forced to go into glucose 6-phosphate. But for step two, this is, we, we can, this is reversible. We can actually go from fructose 6-phosphate and go back to glucose 6-phosphate if you wanted to. Notice the double arrows here. So the isomerase keeps the exact chemical structure, but the physical structure is now rearranged. That's all we did.
We didn't add or subtract anything here. So the ring ha now has four carbons and one oxygen instead of the five carbons and one oxygen. The purpose of this is stabilization for step four. And that's step two. The last step for this video is step three. And this is actually really easy. We're taking the fructose 6-phosphate we just made. We're going to add ATP and phosphofructokinase, which is another enzyme. And we're going to make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and ADP. This is literally a copy and paste from step one. We're taking the ATP, we're shredding the phosphate, and we're adding it here to carbon one. And in result, we get ADP, adenine diphosphate. And that's why it's called fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, saying that there's a phosphate on carbons one and six, carbons one and carbon six. So now it's a mirror image. Carbon six and carbon one are identical. They look the same. That's all we did. So delta G, oh, I forgot the delta sign here. Delta G equals negative 17.2. It's another irreversible flux control step. Breakup of ATP releases energy, just like step one. It's just a different enzyme, and of course a different molecule, but the concept is still the same. All we did is we removed, just like step one, we took off that hydrogen here, and we replaced it with a phosphate group, PO3. Purpose. Well, what's the purpose? The molecule will split into step in step four. So when we actually get to step four, which is the next step, the molecule will split. And we need phosphates on both molecules when it splits. That's the reason. And that's it for step one, two, and three. I'm probably going to do four, five, and six, probably, or maybe just four and five in the next video. So if you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe. Until next time, later.